أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم تبارك الذي جعل في السماء بروجا وجعل فيها سراجا وقمرا منيرا وهو الذي جعل الليل والنهار خلفة لمن أراد لمن أراد أن يذكر أو أراد شكورا وعباد الرحمن الذين يمشون على الأرض هونا وإذا خاطبهم الجاهلون قالوا سلاما الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة المتقين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين Inshallah, we'll be continuing on with ayah number 61 today, inshallah. As I mentioned previously, Surat Al-Furqan, uh, by many of the scholars who focus on the structure, the theme, the thematic uh, structure of the surah, divide Surat Al-Furqan into five passages. And so the conclusion of the fourth passage of Surat Al-Furqan is with ayah number 62. So ayahs number 61 and 62 that we'll be studying today insha'Allah will be the conclusion of the fourth passage of Surah Al-Furqan. And with ayah number 63 we'll start the, fa- the, the final passage of Surah Al-Furqan insha'Allah. So ayah number 61 a translator writes, Exalted is he who put constellations in the heavens, a radiant light and an illuminating moon. So this particular ayah once again, bring it, it, this ayah starts with that um, in the same manner that the surah had started with. And that we saw once again uh, within this surah as well, which is with that phrase of tabaraka. Talking about, we had discussed it before previously that the word tabaraka means most blessed is he. So most blessed is the one. جَعَلَ فِي السَّمَاءِ بُرُوجًا Now, before we actually continue, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bringing this word here again, tabaraka, is for the purpose of connecting it back to the original idea, the original thought. Because, and I'm jumping a little bit ahead here, but I'll try to keep the conversation about the final passage, insha'Allah, uh, once we conclude ayah number 62, or the discussion on ayah 62. But nevertheless, this takes it all the way back to the beginning of the surah, Concluding a lot of the arguments that have been made so far in the surah, particularly within this fourth passage of the surah, which is um, multiple different types of observations in the world around us, and how it serves as proof and evidence of the greatness of Allah and the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and why and how we should submit ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. So Allah says, Tabarak alladhi ja'ala fi sama'i buruja, that most blessed is He, the one who made in the sky burujan. Now, this is the word that is kind of new here that we will discuss. The word buruj is a plural of the word burj. Now, the word burj comes from the, the origin of the word, the root of the word has two core meanings. Aslan, ahaduhuma al buruju, excuse me, al buruzu wa dhuhuru. The first meaning of the word burj is for something to be very apparent and obvious, very noticeable, something that stands out, something that sticks out. Okay? Wal akharu al wazaru wal malja'u. The second meaning of the word burj or the root word that it comes from, the second uh, core meaning of that particular word is for something to be uh, a place or a source of safety. A source or a place of safety. Some place that you would basically go to seek refuge in. All right? Al wazaru wal malja'u. So, the word burj, for this particular reason, it also refers to um, a fortress. A fortress or a castle was also called al-burj. 
And that's why we find it in this particular meaning in the Quran itself, in Surah An-Nisa, ayah number 78. Allah says that, أَيْنَ مَا تَكُونُوا يُدْرِكْكُمُ الْمَوْتُ وَلَوْ كُنْتُمْ فِي بُرُوجٍ مُشَيَّدَةٍ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that no matter where you may be, death will find you, death will approach you, death will come to you, even if you were to be inside of a fortified, a solidified or a protected fortress. And there is emphasis within the ayah because buruj, the word buruj in and of itself refers to a fortress, a castle. Mushayyadatin means that it's further, you know, fortified or it's protected on top of that. All right, so it's not just a castle or a fortress, the big walls, but it's got some other type of protection outside of it. It's got multiple layers of protection. So, Allah, so even in the Quran, in classical Arabic, the word buruj would refer to a fortress and that's the word that's basically being used here. Now, what's fascinating about this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, Tabarakaladi ja'ala fi sama'i burujan. The most blessed is He, the one who made, placed in the sky fortresses. He placed fortresses in the sky. Now, what does that exactly refer to? So, there are two ways that the scholars have interpreted this. Number one, remember that I had mentioned, we just uh, covered this, that the word burj, which means fortress, it comes from the root, which also refers to something being very obvious and something being very apparent. Very apparent and obvious. All right? So this could be referring to the large stars or as many of the translators have alluded to, even classical and more so contemporary, have alluded to that this could be referring to constellations. Constellations of stars in the heavens, in the sky. And why would Allah refer to the constellations as buruj, which means fortresses? Because just like a fortress or a huge castle sticks out, you can see it from a distance. It's very obvious, it becomes a landmark in the area. Everyone identifies that region or that area by means of that fortress or that castle. Similarly, these constellations have become landmarks within the sky. They are markers in the sky. And they are very obvious, they are very noticeable from even a distance. And everyone can spot them and see them and knows them. So this is one reason. And this is a very solid, very legitimate reason that is linguistically grounded and that makes absolute sense and also fits very coherently, very uh, you know, aptly with how the Arabs would use this word and how the Arabs would use such language. The second um, interpretation that the scholars have posited about why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be referring to you know, stars or constellations in the sky as buruj. Why would Allah be talking about fortresses in the sky? So the second reason for that is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions other places within the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Mulk, in the beginning of Surah Al-Mulk, in ayah number 5, Allah says, وَلَقَدْ زَيَّنَّ السَّمَاءَ الدُّنْيَا بِمَصَابِيحَ We have beautified, we have adorned the sky of this world with lanterns, lamps. وَجَعَلْنَاهَا رُجُومًا لِلشَّيَاطِينَ And we have made them stations of striking down the shayateen. And this is making a very specific reference to the dynamic that existed before the time of the Prophet wasallam, and was a primary means by which the shayateen used to confuse and delude people. That what they would basically do is that they would they would go and try to, uh, what's referred to in the Qur'an as istiraqus sama. They would go and, for lack of a better term, they would eavesdrop. They would eavesdrop on the heavens or on the conversations of the angels. They would get, gather bits and pieces of intelligence, information. They would bring it down to their, you know, um, partners in crime, if you will, on this earth soothsayers, magicians, fortune tellers, sorcerers, people that were into these types of nefarious activities that are impermissible by any and every means. And they would feed this information to them and then those people would use that information, they would manipulate that information to confuse people and to you know, distort people's beliefs, ruin people's faith and beliefs and, and creed and theology. 
And so what happened with the birth of the Prophet ﷺ, there were multiple stages to this being curbed. The first stage of putting an end to this was with the birth of the Prophet ﷺ. And there are many narrations to this particular effect. And there are also stories from the seerah which allude to this as well, that with the birth of the Prophet ﷺ, much of this was put a stop to. And a lot of this activity was, was seized. And measures were put into place to start curbing this, this particular issue. And then furthermore, with the onset of revelation, اِقْرَأْ بِسْمِ رَبِّكَ الَّذِي خلق, With the onset of the prophethood, the mission, the message of the Prophet ﷺ, this was completely put an end to. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about it in the Qur'an, وَالسَّمَاءِ وَالطَّارِقِ وَمَا أَدَرَاكَ مَا الطَّارِقِ أَنَّجْمُ الثَّاقِبِ all right? And similarly in the ayah of Surah Al-Mulk that I mentioned, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appointed angels to strike down the shayateen that would try, go there and try to gather this information because now it was the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now it was the era of the Qur'an and now this would no longer be tolerated. And this was furthermore the care, the consideration that was afforded to the ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the people of the Qur'an, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is one of the great blessings of Allah upon this ummah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not test this ummah the way previous nations were tested. So the second reason, as I was explaining, that many of the Mufassirun, Ibn Kathir rahimahullah ta'ala mentions both of these theories, Al-Kawakib Al-Idham, وَهَذَا قَوْلُ مُجَاهِدْ وَسَعِيدُ بْنُ جُبَيْرِ وَأَبِي صَالِحْ وَالْحَسْنِ الْبَصْرِ وَقَتَادَ وَغَيْرُهُمْ مِنَ الْمُفَسِرِينَ That this is the opinion of many of the Mufassirun that refers to constellations. The second, the second uh, tafsir of this is that this is, these constellations are referred to as buruj because these are basically the stations from where the angels strike down these shayateen. All right, and both are completely valid because both have Quranic corroboration, and and are completely accommodated in the language itself. But Ibn Kathir, rahmahullah taala himself, and many of the mufassirun, they say, "Walqawlu al-awwalu azhar." However, the first opinion, the first interpretation, the first tafsir seems more on point. It seems more consistent with how the Arabs would use this word and how the Arabs would construct this type of speech. It seems more in line with the Arabic language. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Tabarak al ja'ala fi sama'i burujan. He put these big beautiful stars, these constellations in the sky. وَجَعَلَ فِيهَا سِرَاجًا وَقَمَرًا مُنِيرًا And He put in the sky sirajan. The word siraj, it means a burning lamp or a lantern. Now what you have to understand about a lamp or a lantern is that it's something that burns, it's something that produces light and also it, it has heat, it's fire. There's a flame in it and it produces light. And that basically refers to the sun. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Qur'an, هُوَ الَّذِي جَعَلَ الشَّمْسَ ضِيَاءً he, Allah, is the one who has made the sun a source of light and heat. And then Allah says, وَقَمَرًا munira," And an illuminated moon. It's both meanings. Well, an illuminated and an illuminating moon. It can be interpreted both ways. That it is both illuminated, and we understand that scientifically, that it's reflecting the light of the sun. And it also illuminates. Meaning what? That on a... Outside on the night of the full moon, we don't notice or appreciate it as much because of all the light pollution, all right? But if you go out into the countryside, right? If you go out in the middle of nowhere, we call it Oklahoma, right? So, um, but if, if, you, if you venture out into the wilderness, then what you'll find over there is on the night of the full moon, Laylat al-Badri, the middle of the lunar month, the full when the full moon is out, you can appreciate how much brighter it is out at night versus at the start or the end of the lunar month. The full moon makes a huge difference out there, a tremendous difference. So it is illuminated, reflecting the light of the sun, but it also illuminates, because those are the nights that it's brightest out. 
Alright? So, this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about. So now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after, remember now, follow this passage. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about, أَلَمْ تَرَ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ كَيْفَ مَدَّ الظِّلَّةِ وَلَوْ شَاءَ لَجَعَلَهُ سَاكِنًا ثُمَّ جَعَلْنَ الشَّمْسَ عَلَيْهِ دَلِيلًا Allah talked about the sun, the blessings in the sky, the celestial blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah talked about the rain coming down to the earth. Then He talked about the blessings of Allah on the earth. He talked about the blessings of Allah within the human being, him or herself, themselves. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala draws our attention back up to the sky because this is the transi- these two verses, these two ayat are transitionary verses that are going to carry us into the final passage. So it draws our attention back up to the sky to emphasize the revelation, the guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it raises our gazes back up to the sky. And it lifts our spirits back up to focus on the higher objective. And to also focus back in on the guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, so again it's saying Allah is the one who put in the sky these constellations, these stars. And then He put the sun and the moon in the sky. Now, something very remarkable and very profound. And again, I don't want to... I've spoken about being very cautious and careful about this, so I don't want to fall prey and fall victim to exactly what I've cautioned about. So we should be careful about some very esoteric, um, very allegorical interpretations of the Qur'an where things start to get really out of control. So I will try to restrain and refrain and kind of filter through a lot of what's been written um, in terms of a reflection on this. But just focusing more on what we can find corroboration for within the, within the Qur'an or the words of the Prophet And What I'm basically alluding to is that in the Qur'an itself, in the Qur'an itself, see Allah said Qamaran, okay, He said the word moon, but then He called the word munir. But Allah did not say the word sun in this ayah. He used the word siraj, lamp, lantern, and referred to the sun by calling it a lamp. What else in the Qur'an has Allah described as being a lamp? And what other entity has Allah used the adjective, the sifa, the description of being munir? Exactly. The Prophet ﷺ. Allah has in the Qur'an. See, that's why I was saying that a lot of times these are areas where people get very, what we like to call creative, right? What we saw earlier, Imam Qurtubi called stupid, right? So sometimes people get very excited and then they kind of start making connections and extrapolations which are not really intellectual and they're not, they have no credence and no evidence. Okay, and that's fine if somebody wants to, feels that way, but there's a big difference between feeling something and knowing something, right? Um, and I know that's very confusing, nobody understands what I'm talking about now, but there's the difference. You can feel a certain way and it doesn't make it real. But anyways, so, in the Qur'an itself though, Allah uses the word siraj for the Prophet ﷺ. And He uses the description of munid, the adjective of munid, for the Prophet ﷺ. Remarkable. Where in Surah Al-Ahzab, Surah number 33, Allah says to the Prophet ﷺ, He addresses him directly. Ya أَيُّهَا النَّبِيُّ إِنَّا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ شَاهِدًا وَمُبَشِّرًا وَنَذِيرًا that, O oh Prophet, we have sent you as a witness and as a bringer of good news and as a warner, somebody to compassionately warn and caution humanity. And we have sent you to call anyone and everyone to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by His permission. Wasirajan munira. And we have sent you as a siraj, as a lamp, as a source of light. Munira, and as one that is illuminated and illuminates others. And this is so remarkable that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likens the Prophet ﷺ to both the sun and the moon. To both the sun and the moon. And there's been, if you go and study those verses, those ayat, it's been a fascination of the Mufassirun because we understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likening the Prophet ﷺ to the moon, we understand that, we comprehend that. Why? Because the moon does what? It reflects the light of the sun. So the Prophet ﷺ reflects the divine light, if you will. 
the Quran, revelation comes to him, and he reflects that, he projects that, he demonstrates that, he realizes that and manifests the Quran amongst the people in this world. And by means of that, everyone around him is illuminated as well, just like we're illuminated by the moon on the night of the full moon. But Allah called the Prophet ﷺ Sirajan as well. And that's very interesting, very remarkable. And no, this should not lead to any confusion about assigning, you know, deifying the Prophet ﷺ. No, no, no. We don't, we don't go down that rabbit hole. We don't fall in that trap. We are not assigning any type of divinity to the Prophet ﷺ, no. But more so the scholars say, and the Mufassirun have discussed this at length, one of the theories or one of the explanations that makes the most sense is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dignified the Prophet ﷺ so much so that the guidance from Allah, the legislation from Allah doesn't only come in the form of the Qur'an but also comes through the Prophet ﷺ. He's still the vessel. It's still coming from Allah. But Allah made it originate from His mouth. Allah made it originate from His actions. I'll give you an easy, simple example of this. Very straightforward. That no one can really argue. Even the Orientalist types or the progressive types who might not have, you know, a, a very great regard for the prophetic tradition, for the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, the sunnah, even they can't argue with this. And that is the simple fact Allah says in the Quran, Inna salata kanat ala al mu'minina kitaban mawqutan. Prayers mandatory at its fixed times. What are the timings of the prayer? Precisely and exactly. When does it start? When does it end? We know that, right? Break of dawn till the beginning of the rising of the sun. Then you have, once the sun begins its decline, past the zenith, till the shade of everything is of a certain length. Then from that point, when the shade of everything has reached a particular length, from there till the setting of the sun begins. Then once the sun has fully set from there until the stars appear. And then from when the stars appear, then there's some difference of opinion till half the night or so on and so forth, or some say till Fajr time. Where do we get these specific timings from? Those must be some very specifically worded ayat. Right? Where do we get those specific timings from? Oh, that's right. They're not mentioned explicitly laid out like this in the Quran. There's some loose, you know, there's some general references to some of these time frames and windows. Okay, fine. How many raka'at of fard do we pray in fajr? How many mandatory raka'at units of prayer in fajr prayer? Two. And dhuhr? Four. Asr? Four. Maghrib? Three. And isha? Four. Okay. So that means there's an ayah that talks about raka'atani, wa arba'u raka'atin, wa arba'u raka'atin, wa thalathu raka'atin, wa arba'u raka'atin. Oh, there's not though. It comes from the Prophet ﷺ. Okay? Zakat. Nobody can deny the obligation of zakat, charity. Aqimu salata wa atu zakat. Alright? But the nisab of zakat, which means the portions, and how much is to be given, on how much, and so on and so forth, where does all that originate from? Where does all that come from? It's from the Prophet ﷺ. So yes, it still comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but before the Prophet ﷺ spoke it or practiced it, that was the beginning, that was the source of its institution, its legislation. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ was referred to, and this gives honor to the Prophet ﷺ, this gives further credence to the Sunnah, that the life, the words, the actions of the Prophet ﷺ are a legitimate authentic, authoritative source of legislation. 
And there's no arguing that, there's no denying that. That's, Allah refers to the Prophet as both Siraj and Munir. Alright, and that's from the honor of the Prophet And the last little thing that I'll kind of mention here, again, this is now, it's right on the border of when we cross that line into, um, you know, fairy tale land, but the last little idea or reference I'll give to you from the words of the Prophet ﷺ, it's a weaker narration, but some scholars have argued that it is strengthened by the different versions and the different narrations of it. And the idea behind it is valid, where there are narrations in which the Prophet ﷺ refers to his Sahaba as stars in the sky. Ashabi kan nujum. He refers to his companions as stars in the sky. So some have actually mentioned that as we transition into the final passage of Surah Al-Furqan, which we'll talk about in just a moment, inshaAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, while He's drawing our attention back to the blessings of Allah and the sky, and to remind us of Allah and His greatness and revelation and guidance from Allah, because these are also sources of guidance. The moon tells us what, what, what time of the month it is. The sun tells us what time of the day it is. The stars tell us what direction we're facing in. Or what time of the year we're in, what season we're in. Alright? So these are sources of guidance, sources of direction. So as Allah draws our attention to the sources of guidance and direction in this dunya, for worldly means and worldly purposes, He's actually also reminding us that do not forget about your spiritual guidance, and your spiritual direction, the source of your spiritual direction. But alongside of that, there is a very legitimate discussion about a more subtle layer that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also implying and reminding us of that the Prophet and his actions and his speech and his life along with his companions and how they carried the life of the Prophet and they carried it forward and they lived it and they exemplified it, that that is also a profound source of guidance and a very remarkable, powerful source of um, guidance for you and direction in life. Now we proceed on to the next ayah, to the following ayah. In ayah number 62, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَهُوَ الَّذِي جَعَلَ اللَّيْلَ وَالنَّهَارَ خِلْفَةً لِمَنْ أَرَادَ أَنْ يَذَّكَّرَ أَوْ أَرَادَ شُكُورًا A translator writes, It is he who made the night and day follow each other, so anyone who wishes may be mindful or show gratitude. وَهُوَ الَّذِي And this is something Allah has spoken about earlier in this surah, and this is also something Allah speaks about throughout the Qur'an. وَهُوَ الَّذِي جَعَلَ لَيْلَ وَالنَّهَارَ خِلْفَةً He is the one who has made the night and the day follow after one another. خِلْفَةً Basically, أَنْ يَجِيءَ شَيْءٌ بَعْدَ شَيْءٍ يَخُومُ مَقَامَهُ أَوْ خِلَافَ قُدَّامْ أَوْ التَّغَيُّرْ It has three meanings. Number one, it means for one thing to come after another. That makes sense here. The night and the day continue to follow right after one another. Number two, it means for one thing to take the place of the other. That also happens with the night and the day. Or number three, the third meaning of this word, khilfatan, is also for something to change. For something to change. That also fits here because the night and the day keep changing. The situations, the circumstances, the reality of night and day are very different from one another. Your behavior is different between night and day. Your conduct is different. All right. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the night and day coming after, following after one another. All right. And we talked about previously this blessing as well, that if Allah would have made it night continuously or day continuously, that what that would have done to humanity. If it was day continuously, it would have scorched the earth. If it was night continuously, then it would have killed off everything. Nothing would grow, nothing would survive. Along with all the other, I'm talking about the end result would be just absolute, would be annihilation, would be death, would be uh, obliteration. But even in the process of that, think of all the different tragedies and, and all the difficulties that would befall, not just mankind, but all of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if night and day did not alternate the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created a system for. <coughs> so this is a profound blessing from Allah. But as I said before, as we're kind of concluding this passage and transitioning to the final passage, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is invoking some very powerful spiritual themes here, that this changing of the night and day also refers to the fact of the changing of circumstances, the changing of situation. That alayl, the darkness, a lot of times, it's, it's very interesting. 
The night time, the darkness sometimes is also used to refer to difficulty, but also is used to refer to providing some comfort and ease. The daytime is representative many times of the spring of life, and how it brings life forth once more. But it also is representative, a lot of times it's talked about, in the, that it's also a source of fatigue. The daytime causes fatigue as well. It exhausts you, it tires you out, wears you out. It's a very interesting dynamic. And from this, and, and then the other thing to think about that I had, we had spoken about before, that day and night, it doesn't just happen that night all of a sudden just cuts off and then it, boom, somebody flips the switch and now it's immediately daytime. And then flips the switch again and immediately just nighttime. They kind of bleed or blend or merge into one another. And there's portions of the day, both at the front end and the back end, where it's a bit of day and a bit of night, kind of mixed and blended together. And this is a very powerful theme of the, the propensity of the human being. One of the predicaments of the human condition is that human beings are very polarized and very extreme in their views. A human being has a tendency to you know, uh, gravitate towards one extreme or the other, and we've t spoken about this a number of times. So what happens is that a, a person is always looking for either all good or all bad. That should sound very familiar to us. It's either all good or all bad. It requires sometimes a lifetime of tarbiyah, of work, maturation, learning, sophistication, experiences, to finally come to a place where you understand that there is always good and bad in every situation. Aza an tuhibu shay'an, wa huwa sharu lakum. Aza an takrahu shay'an, wa huwa khayru lakum. You dislike something so much in the moment, it turns out to be good for you. Which doesn't just mean that it magically just becomes good for you. There was good for you, uh, good for you in it all along. You just didn't. You just couldn't see it at that moment. You couldn't see it at that time. Your emotions clouded your judgment. And then the vice versa, the flip, is also, is also true. So this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also bringing our attention to here. Number one, good times will follow bad times, and bad times will follow good times. And it's a constant, that's what life is. And we're waiting around for everything to completely just turn the tide, where it'll be all good or all bad. Then we, we, we're delusional. That's not how things work. Look at, the, survey the life of the Prophet ﷺ. This is why and where studying the seerah becomes so profoundly necessary. The scholars have written that one cannot ever truly appreciate what the Qur'an is teaching us, and, excuse me, until and unless you have a very thorough reading of the life of the Prophet ﷺ. Otherwise, this is all theoretical, night and day changing. Okay, maybe if you do a little bit more research and you get to the level of, well, good and bad follow after one another. Maybe you have a frame of reference in your own life, but then how much is, of that is me projecting onto the Qur'an what I feel again? Am I projecting my own reality onto the Qur'an and how much of it is actually true? How much of it holds any significance? But when you go to the life of the Prophet what do you see? Mecca is bad, tough, but was it? Think about the people who stood the firmest by the side of the Prophet ﷺ later on in his life. Where were they, for lack of a better term, recruited? Where were they developed? Where were they trained? Where were they made? They were made in? in Makkah. Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali. Where were they made? They were made in Makkah. Trial by fire. Okay? At the same time, Medina, all great. Was it? <coughs> Uhud was on the doorstep of Medina. Came back, they buried 70 of their people that day. Every home in Medina was mourning. The Prophet ﷺ himself lost family that day. Khandaq, the trench, they almost burned Medina to the ground. 
Not enough food to eat. Okay, the conquest of Makkah happens, then it's all, then, then from there. Really though? The last journey of the Prophet ﷺ, the last military expedition, campaign of the life of the Prophet ﷺ was called Tabuk. What was the situation in Tabuk? There was a Roman army rumored to be 100,000, and then later on the news came possibly 200,000 strong. And there were only 30,000 Muslims after recruiting everyone who could go. <clears throat> they were gonna get wiped out by the Roman army. They didn't show up, but that's what they were expecting. That threat remained up until six months before the Prophet left this world. And just when they did Hajjat al Wida, and now things became very established, and pretty much the entire Arabian Peninsula came into the fold of Islam, and things seemed like now things were gonna roll and things were gonna be smooth, the darkest day that ever came upon this world fell upon the Ummah at that time the Prophet left this world. And no sooner did the Prophet ﷺ leave this world, that a bunch of the Bedouin tribes around Medina all apostatized. They all said, guess what, we're out. And they declared war on Medina. The neighbors of Medina declared war on Medina. The day after the Prophet ﷺ passed away. So this is just a false notion of all good or all bad. And what I mean by good and bad is all ease or all difficulty. It's always a blend, it's always a mix of both. Right? There's constant. Now sometimes there's more difficulty or more ease and one keeps following right after another. That's the story of life. That's what this life is. It's work. I read or I should write motivational posters, right? So, <laughs> all right? I have not given up on that idea, inshallah. All right? Life. You work and then you die, right? So, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> so, but, وَهُوَ الَّذِي جَعَلَ اللَّيْلَ وَالنَّهَارَ خِلْفَةً one after another. That's life. That's what the situation is. But then Allah says, Liman arada, Liman arada, that this is a very powerful. Now, the Mufassirun mentioned this Liman arada for the benefit. This Lam is Lil Manfa'a for the benefit, meaning this is a sign for the benefit. But not just this sign that's mentioned in ayah number 62, the entirety of this passage. From ayah number 48 all the way to ayah number 62. The entirety of this passage is a benefit, is a reminder, is a reflection, is a wake-up call, is a profound sign and a moment of realization for anyone who wants a yadhakar, to pay attention, to wake up, to realize. O arada shukura, or someone who decides to become grateful. This is for your benefit. You got more than enough reason here to wake up and become grateful. And something very remarkable, very profound that the scholars mention is that Liman Arada and Yadakara. Liman Arada and Yadakara, somebody to realize. They said Hada Fi'lu o Hada Amalu al Aqal. This is the Activity of the brain to understand, to realize. And then awrada shukuran hada amalul qalb. Shukr is the action of the heart. And the reason why Allah did not say liman arada and yadakara wa arada shukura. Allah did not say somebody who wants to realize and become grateful. No, no, no. He says somebody who wants to realize. Or wants, or, or wants to become grateful. And this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminding us that everyone's path, everyone's epiphany, everyone's spiritual awakening, everyone's moment of realization is different. Everyone's journey will look different. And everyone will experience that connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or that moment that wakes you up will experience it different, di differently. Some people will have a more intellectual process and journey where they will study and they will understand certain things and realize certain things and then come to that particular realization or conclusion. And some people will submit and become emotionally and spiritually overwhelmed and fall into, you know, a sajda and gratitude before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
It does not matter exactly how you got there. Whether you read a lot or you studied a lot or you prayed a lot. But as long as you reach that particular point where you submit yourself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's what's important and that's what matters. And that's what we're all trying to get to. And there, there are some very interesting and <clears throat> fascinating narrations that talk about kind of the dynamics of the day and night and make this spiritual connection um, that we're talking about in this ayah that I wanted to mention. In a hadith, an authentic narration of the Prophet ﷺ from Sahih Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ تَعَالَىٰ يُبْسِتُ يَدَهُ بِاللَّيْلِ لِيَتُوبَ مُسِيءُ النَّهَارِ وَيُبْسِتُ يَدَهُ بِالنَّهَارِ لِيَتُوبَ مُسِيءُ اللَّيْلِ The Prophet ﷺ, he says that Allah basically spreads his hand, which is an expression for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, provides forgiveness at night for the one who erred during the day. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala once again provides his forgiveness and his mercy during the daytime for the one who erred during the night. So again, you kind of see that mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always present, is omnipresent, whether it be night and day, no matter whether we're in good times or bad times, whether we understand what's going on or we don't understand what's going on, whether we're doing well or we're doing bad, we're handling it well or we're handling it poorly, it doesn't matter, the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is omnipresent, is always there. And we know that we can always turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, we will be embarking on the fifth and the final passage of this surah, which begins with ayah number 63. Now, before we study ayah number 63, I just wanted to give you a brief introduction to this last fifth and final passage of the surah. This starts with ayah number 63, and of course, concludes with ayah number 77, the end of the surah. So in this final passage, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is of course a very famous passage, a very well-known passage. It is a passage that is oftentimes alluded to, referred to as the passage of Ibadur Rahman. The Ibadur Rahman passage. The passage about the slaves of the most merciful. And so of course in this passage, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will detail the attributes, the qualities, the characteristics, the traits, uh, the actions of those who live a life of devotion and submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in mentioning them at the very, very end, the scholars mention a few benefits and some wisdoms of this. Um, you know, they're mentioned coming at the very end. Number one, the first thing they mention is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala earlier in the surah has talked about the people who do not believe in Allah, who do not submit to Allah. And so Allah will conclude by now talking about those who do believe in Allah and do submit to Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this last passage has talked about all the proofs of belief. And why to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In this passage Allah will detail that when you do finally believe in Allah, then what does that look like? What is the effect and the impact of that? What is the reality of believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Alright? So, inshallah, um, we'll continue to see this and explore this as we go through the passage. Ayah number 63, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَعِبَادُ الرَّحْمَانِ الَّذِينَ يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ هَوْنَا وَإِذَا خَاطَبَهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ قَالُوا سَلَامًا Translator writes, the servants of the Lord of mercy are those who walk humbly on the earth and who, when the foolish address them, reply, peace. So the first, the ayah begins by saying, Wa ibadur Rahman, ibadur Rahman. This is the muqtada, this is the subject of the sentence. All right? And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is calling and drawing our attention to. This is what Allah will be defining. Not just in the rest of this ayah, the remainder of this ayah, but this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be defining for the coming ayat and the coming verses. Ibadur Rahman, the slaves of the most merciful. One of the very interesting things that the Mufassirun mentioned based off of just the structure, the coherence, um, the, the, the 
continuity and the um, flow of the surah is that why didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say وَعِبَادُ رَبِّهِمْ or وَعِبَادُ اللَّهِ right because nothing is more powerful than the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself Allah وَعِبَادُ اللَّهِ but Allah does not say وَعِبَادُ اللَّهِ He says وَعِبَادُ الرَّحْمَنِ what did we just read about in ayah number 60 what did we just discuss and learn about in ayah number 60? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that when they are told to prostrate, to do sajda to ar-Rahman. What do they respond by saying? Man rahman What's this Rahman business? What are you talking about Rahman? What is this? Who's that? What are you talking about? That, that, you know, that, uh, that insolence and disrespect and blasphemy. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins this passage by saying, but there are those, just as these people, completely deny, refuse, reject, and mock Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the presence of Ar-Rahman within their lives, <clears throat> there are those who embrace belief in Ar-Rahman. And they immerse themselves into the obedience of Ar-Rahman. And they completely submit to Ar-Rahman. And this is what they look like. وَعِبَادُ Rahman. Allah says, الَّذِينَ They are those, يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ هَوْنًا They walk upon the earth, هَوْنًا The translator had written humbly. The word هَوْن in the Arabic language, يَدُلُّ عَلَى سُكُونٍ سَكِينَةٍ أَوْ ذُلٍ that this word refers to calmness, tranquility, serenity, humility. وَمِن ذَلِكَ الْهَوْنُ السَّكِينَةُ وَالْوَقَارُ The word hone refers to being very peaceful, tranquil, and dignified. Being very calm, serene. You know sometimes you're in, you're in someone's company, or you're in someone's presence, and they're quiet, very calm and relaxed. And there's, you, you just feel peaceful or you feel a sense of serenity in their presence. It's a, they have a very calming effect on you. Right? Again, I see the puzzled looks, right? Because this wonderful generation calls that awkward, right? So if something is not constantly, someone or something is not constantly talking, then it's so awkward. Right? So awkward. Terrible. Right? One of our very senior, senior mashayikh and teachers that we had the opportunity to learn from and benefit from, he was a remarkable, profound scholar. He had taught ilm, knowledge to students for 60 years. He passed away in his 90s. And he what was somebody who would teach a lot and he would talk and converse and discuss but he was actually known for just long stretches of just silence and particularly in his later years as he got older he would be silent quite a bit and i had read he was very famous he he was a teacher he was a scholar but he was a remarkable mentor remarkable just that be was his thing and so he would mentor scholars. Right? He was like a scholar scholar. He was a teacher's teacher. A mentor of teachers. And his letters were the stuff of legend. He would write letters to that's where you take a piece of paper and a <laughs> pen and you draw shapes on paper and then you fold it and mail it to somebody. All right? But uh I just thought I would explain since nobody understands. But uh he would write letters to a lot of his students and his mentees and stuff, and they were amazing, they were legendary. Some of our teachers, you know, I'd read some of the letters and things like that, and the advice that he would impart. And, um, you know, my father had actually had the pleasure and opportunity of meeting him on one of his travels abroad, and, you know, he came back just really affected, deeply affected by just, you know, getting advice from him and being in his company and learning from him. And so I had, you know, that particular goal that I wanted to meet him and benefit from him. Um, towards the very end of his life, actually he passed away just a couple of months after that, um, he came through town um, and 
he they were trying to kind of keep it low key his health was not as good anymore um and so but one of our teachers let a few of us know kind of that you know he's in town for about a week staying at this particular place but we're trying to keep it low key but i let y'all know since you know y'all could really use his help but uh so it wasn't a good thing. We weren't like star students. He's like, you really need it. So, um, so I said, okay, alhamdulillah, I'll take it. And um, so we went there and we spent pretty much the whole week with him, sleeping there, eating there, praying there, reading there. And there would be long stretches of hours upon hours upon hours. We would sit there and he'd be reading Quran. And he'd just be quiet and silent, just in reflection and thought. And you know, obviously, you come across those people, it's like an ocean of knowledge, and experience, wisdom. Someone asked him that, you know, Shaykh, you have so much benefit to impart. And we learn so much from you when you teach us, when you talk to us. Um, but you're quiet so much um, that wouldn't it be beneficial to impart that? And I just ask, you know. And he said something, he said that if you cannot learn from my silence, then you'll learn nothing from my words. And what he was teaching us and what, was he, what, we, what he was imparting to us is that knowledge and a lot of the benefit of knowledge is really attained through a lot of reflection, contemplation, introspection, thought, kind of sitting with it for a while, thinking about it, praying on it, reflecting on it. But when you're constantly moving, either physically, and the worst of all, if your mouth is constantly moving, then that's just draining everything from your heart and your brain. But learn to be, have moments of quiet. The Prophet ﷺ was remarkable in that way. Such a balanced personality. But the Sahaba say that when he would talk, he was very engaging and very lively and very attentive and kind. He would engage people when he would talk to them. But he would have long stretches of silence as well. There are moments where you would sit there with the Prophet ﷺ and he would be quiet and silent and dhikr and reflection and thought. And we learned from that to have moments of thought and reflection. And so, this concept of hone that we're reading about in the ayah, الَّذِينَ يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ هَوْنًا Hone also refers to sakina wal waqar Dignity, calmness, serenity. And <clears throat> this is used in a hadith of the Prophet wasallam, where the Prophet wasallam, excuse me, he describes the believers as al mu'minuna hayyinuna layyinun. That the believers are very calm and very soft, very gentle. Calmness and gentleness. Very calm and very gentle. Very easy going. That's a quality of the believers. And so now, What's very particular here, and, and in fact the Arabs would have an expression, the Arabs had an expression, إِذَا عَزَّ أَخُوكَ فَهِن إِذَا عَزَّ أَخُوكَ فَهِن That basically means, وَمَعْنَهُ إِذَا عَاسَرَ فَيَاسِرُ That if somebody is rough with you, somebody is abrupt with you, then be very calm in your response to them. And if you've ever experimented or tried that, where somebody's being very abrupt or being very riled up, and you respond very calmly, it, it's, it's like dousing the flame. It's like putting out a fire. The person immediately comes down a couple of notches. But what happens when you respond back to meet that person's level, then that person feels like they have to go up a couple of more notches. Right? And then it becomes a masjid board meeting. Right? <laughs> but when somebody comes at you, calm, relaxed. Alright? So, الَّذِينَ يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ هُنَا Now, what's fascinating about this is, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala combines his quality of hone, being very calm, being very serene, being very tranquil with walking upon the earth. So how does this relate to walking exactly? So there's a lot of discussion about this. Some have suggested, Ibn Kathir rahimahullah ta'ala kind of goes in on this particular topic. Some have kind of suggested about they walk with humility. But what some did was, they took that concept a little too far where they almost, um, Ibn Kathir talks about some of the people who, instead of being pious, they feign piety. Instead of being pious, they feign piety. They, 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 they are very dramatic about their piety. The word that they would use for this is tasannur. Tasannur, they're very dramatic. Their piety is very dramatic. Okay? And that's very, very problematic. So they would almost kind of like walk, like very hunched over and, you know, shuffle their feet back and forth and, you know, kind of whimper when they talk and, oh, it's so pious. <laughs> right? That they, this was this tasannur. Ibn Kathir saw it going on at his time. Think about it. Going on at his time. He saw this. And so Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah ta'ala, he says, لا وليس المراد أنهم يمشون كالمرضى من التصانوع تصنعاً ورياءاً Strong words. He says it doesn't mean that they walk around like they're diseased. That they walk around like they're diseased. They're pretending and showing off to people. Oh, look how pious I am. Right? That's, that's not piety. That's not what this ayah teaches us. He says, فَقَدْ كَانَ سَيِّدُ وُلْدِ آدَمَ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَمَ إِذَا مَشَى كَأَنَّمَا يَنْحَطُ مِنْ سَبَبٍ because the Prophet ﷺ, the best human being that ever walked the face of this earth, when he would walk, he was described as walking with a lot of conviction. He used to lift his leg up all the way and plant his feet very firmly when he walked. It looked like he was kind of coming down a hill, where he stood straight, he had good posture. Again, it didn't mean that he was walking like arrogantly, like picking, looking for a fight. Like he wasn't walking around like, let's go, right? But rather he had good posture, he stood straight. And when he walked, it's like when you're walking down a hill, you know how you plant your feet very firmly because you don't want to start slipping? You're not shuffling your feet? That's how the Prophet of walked, very firmly, with good posture. All right? And then, وَكَأَنَّمَا الْأَرْضُ تُطْوَى لَهُ And the Prophet ﷺ used to walk with such deliberation, like he was going somewhere. He knew where he was going, and he was trying to get there and not waste any time on the way there. And he didn't have time for dramatics and for displays of, you know, false piety. But it was like the earth was being folded for him. Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, when he talks about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam walking, it's actually quite remarkable. He says, um, about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and how he used to walk, he says that, inna. Kunna najhad. He says that we used to struggle to keep up with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That we used to struggle to keep up with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he would not even break a sweat while he was walking. Yes, he says that Abu Huraira, excuse me, Abu Huraira radiallahu taala anhu narrates this. He says, "Mara aitu shayan ahsan min Rasulai sallallahu alaihi wasallam ka anna wajhi." I never saw anything more beautiful than the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. It was like the sun was in his face, like his face was so bright and illuminating, and it was warm. Wa mara aitu ahdan asra afi mashiyatihi min Rasulai sallallahu alaihi wasallam. I never saw somebody walking at, at, at a quicker pace than the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to walk. And then he says, كَأَنَّمَا الْأَرْضِ تُطْوَى لَهُ It was as if the earth was being folded for him. He says, وَإِنَّا لَنَجْهَدْ أَنفُسَنَا وَإِنَّهُ لَغَيْرُ مُكْتَرِثٍ We used to struggle to keep up with him and he wasn't even breaking a sweat. He wasn't even trying. Alright, so Ibn Kathir, going back to what I was saying, he talks about this idea and he says, no, 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 this is not what this means. In fact, he says, قَدْ كَرِهَ بَعْضُ السَّلَفِ الْمَشْيُ بِتَضَاعُفٍ وَتَصَنُّعٍ he says, some of the Salaf have written that it is makru, it is disliked for somebody to walk around acting like they're really weak and making, you know, making a display of how humble they are. That this is makru, because this leads to vanity and ostentation, riyah, showing off. This is problematic, spiritually very problematic. 
Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he mentions hatta ruwiya an Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu annahu ra'a shabban yamshi ruwaydan. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu saw a young man, young, a young man. Okay, we're not talking about like somebody very elderly, 80, 90 years old. No, he saw a young man, like a 20 year old, and he was walking, and again, in that same manner that I kind of described, kind of shuffling along, really hunched over, like really slowly, meek, all right? And the Umar radiallahu ta'ala said, Ma baluk, what's wrong with you? Anta marid? He said, are you sick? Are you ill? Do you require medical attention? Right? I'm both serious and I'm threatening you at the same time. <laughs> right? In a very unique sa anta marid, do you need medical assistance? Right? Qala la ya amirul mu'mineen. Right? He said, no, ya amirul mu'mineen, I'm not sick. All right? So, فَعَلَاهُ بِالدُرَّةِ <laughs> Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu hit him on the back and made him straighten his back up. Because he was all hunched over like this and pretending and acting very meek and humble and he like gave him a nice whack on the back and straightened out his back. فَعَلَاهُ بِالدُرَّةِ وَأَمْرَهُ أَنْ يَمْشِيَ بِقُوَّةِ He said when you walk, walk, walk like, you, like God has blessed you with, with youth. And, and energy, and, and strength. So, <clears throat> rather he says, وَإِنَّمَا الْمُرَادُ بِالْهَوْنِ هَا هُنَا السَّكِينَةُ وَالْوَقَارِ It means, they يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ هَوْنًا That the slaves of the Most Merciful, when they walk on the earth, they walk with hawn, that means they walk with dignity. They walk with tranquility. Not that they just drag themselves along, but they walk with honor and dignity. There's many, there's many components. This is the Qur'an, right? So it's so deep and profound. I mean, number one, they mind their own business. Ah, think about that. When you're walking, when you're walking along, and you walk by people, and maybe two people are having a conversation, how easy is it to start like paying attention to their conversation like this? Right? And you start to kind of lean in that direction. It's very easy. But no, no, no. Mind your own business. You're walking along, you pass by someone's house, doors open, windows open. Almost natural reaction, you turn your head, and then you keep looking. No, 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 no. Mind your own business. It doesn't concern you. Even when driving along in our cars, now you pull up to the light, and you just start to stare over at somebody. <laughs> What are you? <laughs> Why? It's none of your concern. Mind your own business. So this is this is the first thing. Mind your own business. That's part of the sakina wal waqar. Dignity. Have have some dignity. Mind your own business. Stop invading other people's privacy. Okay. Number two, the second part of sakina and wal waqar is not to be ill mannered. Not to be ill-mannered. And again, a lot of times, you know, in popular culture, a lot of times in popular culture, there are these dynamics where walking around, kind of shouting and yelling at people, you know, um, you know, even particularly, I, I use the example of driving because it's just such a common dynamic in our times, but cutting people off, like if you're walking along on a sidewalk and somebody's coming the other way, they're not kind of moving over and making room for somebody. Because the world revolves around you, right? So it's being respectful of other people as well. Minding your own business, being respectful of other people. If somebody else is not minding their own business, if somebody else is not being respectful of other people, then be, you being very humble, and not feeling like you are somehow the equalizer in this situation. But you conducting yourself with humility, with humbleness. The Prophet ﷺ, remember they criticized Yamshi fil Aswaq, but I had mentioned that Makana Sahaban. The Prophet ﷺ didn't go to the marketplaces and yell and scream and talk loudly and argue with people and throw things at people the way people would act in the marketplaces. 
They go in the marketplace and act like wild animals. The Prophet said, went in the marketplace, but he conducted himself with such a remarkable dignity. So that's what's meant by the Sakina and the Waqar. <clears throat> And the Prophet ﷺ told us about this when it comes to the prayer as well. كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا أتيتم الصلاة فلا تأتوها وأنتم تسعون. The Prophet ﷺ said that when you come for the prayer, when you come to the prayer, فلا تأتوها وأنتم تسعون. Don't come to the prayer where you're like sprinting towards the prayer. That doesn't mean like be slow and deliberate on purpose where you park your car and then you back it up and then you fix it a little bit more nicer and then you turn off your car and then you get out and you check, oh, did I get my phone? Did I get my wallet? And then you lock your car and then you slowly stroll through the parking lot, look at the trees, right? No, no, it's, if you know it's time for salah, you pulled up to the masjid, at 10 o'clock, and you know salah starts at 10 o'clock, then you park your car, you get out, and you kind of walk quickly towards. People oftentimes ask me about this, but didn't the Prophet say you shouldn't hurry, rush to the prayer? No, no, in fact, Allah said, فَسْعَوْ إِلَىٰ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ The Qur'an says, rush to the remembrance of Allah. The Prophet said, pray as soon as the time comes. So you do make prayer a priority, and you do rush to the prayer, but what he's talking about is, don't start behaving in an undignified fashion. So now, you turn onto Kelly Boulevard and it turns 10 o'clock. So now, it's NASCAR, right? <laughs> now it's the Indy 500. Now you're driving down Kelly Boulevard at 75 miles per hour. La abadan, haram. That's what the Prophet ﷺ said, don't do that. Now you're cutting off people. Now that turn that you make onto the street of the masjid is not even a turn. You drift <laughs> into the masjid parking lot. Right? That's what he's saying, don't do that. And then you park your car like right out here in the front of the masjid fire lane where you're not allowed to park. And then you rush in and there's a kid standing at the door of the masjid. The kid goes flying and you're in the masjid. Why? I have to pray. Salah, brother. Salah. The Prophet says, don't do that. And also when you get to the prayer then, then what do you look like? Now you're sweating, you're all breathing heavy, breathing out of your mouth. Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> I'm sorry about that, but the Imam can hear you breathing. It's not okay. That's what the Prophet is saying, that's what you should not do. Don't come to the prayer like that. Rather the Prophet says, says, Come to the prayer and you seem dignified. Like if somebody, <clears throat> if somebody was watching you and observing you, they would be so impressed. Because they would see both a level of concern, this person cares. This person is going to this as if it's important. But at the same time, look, this person didn't break any rules or laws. This person held the door open and let somebody else go first. You see that balance? That's what he's teaching us. And if whatever you catch of the prayer you prayed and you missed a rak'ah, you make it up afterwards. There's a solution to that problem. Alright? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ هُمْ then the second part of the ayah says, وَإِذَا خَاطَبَهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ قَالُوا سَلَامًا And when the ignorant people address them, when the ignorant people address them, they say, سَلَامًا Now, what's meant by the ignorant people here, is also a subject of discussion by many of the mufassirun, many of the scholars. And they say that, it's not only just someone who doesn't know any better, but it's particularly, because even in classical Arabic and in classical Arabic poetry, the word jahala wasn't only just about not being informed about something, but it was somebody who knows better and yet still behaves as if they don't know better. That's true jahala. That's true jahala. That's true ignorance. So when ill-mannered, deliberately ignorant, behaving people confront them, qalu. They say salaman. Now, what exactly is the meaning of salaman here? Min al siha wal afia. Wa salama an yaslim al insanu min al ahati wal adha. It basically means to be safe, 
to be healthy, to be protected from harm, from evil. This is why that one of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is as-salam. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, number one, is free of any deficiencies or faults. No harm can come to Him. And He also bestows peace and safety, health and security upon His creation, upon His slaves. In fact, Allah says in the Qur'an, وَاللَّهُ يَدْعُوا إِلَىٰ That is salam. God calls you to the place of as-salam, which is paradise. Because there is no sickness, there's no illness, there's no deficiency, there's no harm, there's no danger in paradise, in the life of the hereafter. So hence it's called Darus salam Now, this is something Allah has spoken about other places in the Qur'an as well. In Surah Al-Qasas, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا سَمِعُوا اللَّغْوَ أَعْرَضُوا عَنْهُ Surah number 28, Allah says, that when they hear unnecessary, frivolous talk, أَعْرَضُوا عَنْهُ They avoid it. Step right around it. وَقَالُوا لَنَا أَعْمَالُنَا وَلَكُمْ أَعْمَالُكُمْ They say, look, I have to worry about my deeds, you worry about yourself. I worry about myself, you worry about yourself. سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ Peace be upon you. لَا نَبْتَغِ الْجَاهِلِينَ I'm not looking for any trouble. And I don't want to get involved with people who are looking for trouble. This is the attitude of the believers. So when they come across tr- troublesome people, problematic people, then they sidestep that situation by invoking peace. Now what's meant exactly by the word salam? And does it literally mean that they say assalamu alaikum? Some, that is one of the interpretations of it. Some scholars have said that they basically, and what that means is that they depart. هَذَا لَيْسَ بِسَلَامٌ هَذَا لَيْسَ سَلَامٌ بِتَحِيَّةٍ تَحِيَّةً بَلْ سَلَامٌ تَوْدِيعًا Rather, this is a salam to depart. To go your own separate ways. So they basically get up and they leave that gathering. Okay? And however, salam has also been interpreted by basically saying something good. Trying to contribute something good to that bad situation. Mujahid says that قَالُوا سِدَادًا They say something good. Sa'id bin Jubair says, رَدُّوا مَعْرُوفًا مِنَ الْقَوْلِ They try to conclude, wrap things up by saying something positive, something good. Hassan al-Basri says, حُلَمَا لَا يَجْهَلُونَ وَإِنْ جَهِلَ عَلَيْهِمْ حَلِمُوا They are very calm, dignified people, and people behave in an opposite fashion. They behave, they behave ignorantly, they respond with even more forbearance. They respond with even greater dignity in the face of greater ignorance. And this is something, this overall attitude that is being described is something Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has talked about in Surah Al-Isra, where Allah says, وَلَا تَمْشِي فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَحَ Do not walk on the earth arrogantly. إِنَّكَ لَن تَخْرِقَ الْأَرْضَ وَلَن تَبْلُغَ الْجِبَالَ تُولَ you're not going to rip a hole in the earth, nor will you become as big as the mountains. So, size yourself up. Take a long hard look in the mirror and know your reality and conduct yourself accordingly. And lastly and finally, again to kind of highlight the coherence of the surah. Previously, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had told us about people, أُولَٰئِكَ كَالْأَنْعَامِ بَلْ هُمْ they are like animals, rather they are even more astray, more lost than cattle. And now Allah tells us about the slaves of the most merciful, who conduct themselves with dignity, and they respond to ignorance with greater dignity. Humility and, and dignity, and they try to curb the problems and the issues in society by contributing, by being a solution to that problem. And. Lastly and finally, one of the Mufassirun, he mentioned something very profound. Imam al-Razi says, this tells us two things, two objectives. Number one, تَرْكُ الْإِذَا Do not be the source of causing other people harm. يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ هَلْمًا Be humble. Number two, when somebody afflicts harm on you, then know how to respond in that situation. وَإِذَا خَاطَبَكُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ don't be the source of harm, and when others harm you, then know how to handle those situations. 
May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the ability to practice everything we've said and heard. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta. Nasaghfiruka wa natubu ilayhi.